Okay, um, I am going to redo the recording for this section uh, of the uh, review because I've had a few questions um, that have made it clearer to me that there is some misunderstanding. And so I've slightly updated the notes and I'm going to redo this part of the uh, recording and I'm going to try to be uh, a bit clearer about the explanation. So I've made some ugly, but I think helpful drawings uh, and so on. Um, so basically um, where the previous uh, recording left it was that uh, recombination is a term um, that it refers to both independent assortment um, and crossing over. And these are two different ways that um, progeny, offspring, can have different allele combinations than their parents did. Um, and I'm going to start here with just a quick explanation using genes that are unlinked. So I'm going to actually write unlinked here. Unlinked. Unlinked specifically means that the genes are on two different chromosomes. So we're following uh, gene A which is on one chromosome, and then on a different chromosome, gene B. And the, if this is the female parent, um, there's two copies um, of the dominant allele and two copies of the recessive allele on this other chromosome, and so on over here. And I've just added some phenotypes uh, to these so that, um, just it for interest in a way, uh, but these are the genotypes. So the red eye allele is the dominant, the orange eye allele is recessive, um, the curly wing uh, allele is recessive, and the straight wing, the normal wing, is dominant. And so basically, if you cross these two pure breeding parents, pure breeding means that um, they are homozygous for all the genes that we're following in the cross. So that if you leave these two breed with each other, all the time, all their progeny look exactly the same, orange colored eyes instead of red, and normal straight wings. And the same with this group, the normal red eyes, but curly wings um, for all the progeny in, in that stock. But when we cross them to each other, we get heterozygous um, progeny. And these are called dihybrids because they're heterozygous for two genes. Okay, I don't want to take all of your time, so I'm just going to write this quickly, but I won't rewrite everything I'm saying because uh, I have to use the mouse and I have to use my right hand and I'm actually left-handed, so it's not very clear. Um, so this is a dihybrid individual, and if we want to, oops, if we want to look at um, uh, recombination, we're going to be talking in this case about independent assortment, uh, but it's best if we do a test cross. We cross them to individuals that are homozygous for the recessive alleles, and then we only have to really look at what happened in this uh, individual, uh, this parent, um, for the cross to figure out recombination frequency, which is R, and that's explained in more detail uh, momentarily. Uh, we, use a, we use a test cross because this individual can only provide recessive alleles. So then whatever allele is passed on by this parent is, is what dictates what the phenotype looks like. So if it inherits, oh, for heaven's sake, if it inherits um, the dominant allele, it's going to have the red eyes. And if it inherits um, the recessive allele, uh, it's going to have orange eyes. And then the same for the B gene. If the individuals inherit the dominant allele, they're going to have the straight wings. Uh, but if they inherit the recessive allele, they're going to have the curly wings. Because only recessive alleles are provided by this parent. So when we look, we see four different categories of offspring. The dominant A um, can be passed on with the uh, dominant B or with the recessive B. Because they're not on the same chromosome, there's no connection or reason for the two dominants to necessarily go together, right? It's like flipping two coins. If one coin comes up heads, it doesn't check and see whether the other coin is also coming up ahead. It just, it, it's combined with either a head or a tail, whatever the other coin uh, comes up. And so that's the same for uh, heterozygous individuals. The chance of passing on the B, B 
big B or little b allele, the dominant or the recessive allele, is just 50-50, just like a coin toss. So we have four categories, um, and uh, that will be big A and small b in terms of uh, what this parent uh, provided, or small and big A. So, um, and these are the parental types, right, because this looks like this original parent. It has orange eyes and straight wings. And this one looks like that original parent. It has the red eyes and the curly wings. But there are two other combinations that are not like the parents. The red eyes with the straight, straight wings. So red eyes like this parent, but straight wing like that one. That's not one of the original combinations. And curly wings and orange eyes. And so these are called the non-parental types. Okay? And they're the result of, in this case, independent assortment. Um, if the genes are on separate chromosomes, each one of these is going to be 25%. So 50% of the progeny are going to be the recombinant ones. And 50% of the progeny are going to be that looks like a 56. That's a 50. Um, and so R is basically the non-parentals divided by the total. So that'll be 50% divided by 100%. And that is expressed in a decimal, and it's given as 0 0.05. And I'm going to explain more about uh, R on the next slide. Sorry that took a bit long, but I really wanted to make some of those things clear because I think it will help understand better than what I had recorded before. Okay, so when we calculate our value, it's, as I said, it's expressed as a decimal, and it is by counting up the non-parental types divided by all of the progeny. And you have to do it this way with a test cross. Okay, so if the genes are in separate chromosomes, uh, R is going to be um, 0.5 as I showed on the previous slide. But what if the genes are on the same chromosome and they're super close together? And they're so close together that, you know, crossover is happening all over the chromosome, but it never, it, it can't happen between uh, the two genes because they're just so close together, it's not possible to get a, a crossover. Uh, it's very rare, um, but it can happen if you've got two genes right next door to each other. The chance of a crossover between those two genes is really small. And then um, the R value we would calculate from our, our cross would be zero. So the value of R is uh, minimum zero and maximum 0 0.5. If you ever do an, a, a, a calculation um, and you come up with like R equals 0.68 or something like that, uh, that is wrong. Something is not correct. You haven't chosen your parentals and non-parentals correctly or Maybe the data are not very good. They're, they're miscategorized um, uh, or something like that. Um, so you always want to check your work. If you punch that into the calculator and that's what you get, first of all, punch it in again. Second time, just to make sure that you didn't just make a, a little mistake in, in punching in the numbers. But then if you get the same one again, then there's something wrong with the way you've set up your calculation and you want to go back and recheck. Okay. So these are the extremes. Oh, and there's something that should be there. Um, but in between those, oops, in between those extremes, come on, go back. Um, the genes are, if the genes are on uh, the same chromosome and there's some distance apart, um, then you can get some crossover between them. Most of the time, the parental ones, the non-crossover ones, will be passed on. But if crossover occurs between the two, that is where the chromosomes actually break and uh, rejoin so that this part of this chromosome ends up being connected to that part of that chromosome, then now what we have is um, non-parental combinations. And they will happen less than 50% of the time. And if you want um, uh, me to go over with you the reason why our value can never be more than 50%. Um, I'm, I'm ha I can go over that with you. Uh, but if you just remember um, that crossover rates are 50% or fewer. Now, if genes are really close together, um, 
then you're going to get a small amount of crossing over, whereas if the genes are further apart, there's more opportunities. Think of the chromosome um, or crossing over, let's say, as having an equal chance of happening at every point. And it happens in, in random positions, so there's no magic place where crossover happens. Um, so anywhere along the chromosome, you could get a crossover, okay? Um, and you could get multiple crossovers, too. Uh, which I probably won't talk about in, in this particular example. Um, but in any case, so you'll have more crossovers between genes A and B, and so more of the uh, non-parental combinations of big A, big B, and little a, little b, um, and, and it will not go over 50%, but maybe 30% crossover, right? Because, you know, there's a reasonable distance and 30% of the time you have some crossover here. Um, whereas in a case like this, there's less opportunity for crossover to happen because there's only a small distance. And so maybe it's only 5% or something like that because the genes are much closer together. If we do an experiment and we find that there's 5% crossover, we say that the genes are five map units apart. So one map unit is 1% crossing over. So think about how many map units uh, would this be if we observed 30% crossover. And I'll leave you with that question. OK, and then just a reminder of parental versus non-parental combinations, uh, crossing over occurs in meiosis, so the chromosomes are replicated, and so drawing it this way gives a nice um, picture of the crossover and the non-crossover. So if you've got a, a chromosome, a pair of homologs here that are replicated, um, and let's just say a crossover occurs between genes A and B, uh, then if this chromatid gets passed on to the next, um, uh, to the offspring, it's going to have the two dominant alleles on it, and that's a crossover chromosome, or a non-parental, we would call it. Um, and this chromosome is also generated, so some offspring will get that, and that will also be a non-crossover. But if there hasn't been any crossing over, if a chromatid hasn't um, taken part in that, then it's going to be passed on exactly as it was received from the original parent, uh, and that's a non-crossover or a parental type. Okay, so I don't mind if you call them parental and non-parental or crossover and non-crossover, so long as you keep straight what that means. Parental means no crossover happened, and non-parental means crossover did happen. And if you were looking at data um, from a cross and you didn't know which chromosome, you know, uh, you, you found that the genes were linked because you had two that were a lower number, and then two that were a higher number of offspring, you would be able to tell what the, what the arrangement had been. So you would be able to go back and say, OK, uh, one of the parents had you know, this genotype, and the other parent had this genotype. And the reason why you can say that is because this is the, the class that's most common. and um, this is the class that's most common. These are the less frequent, and that means they come from crossover, and therefore they're the non-parental types. So hopefully that's clear. That's another question that has come up from more than one student um, that I hope this will clarify. If not, just email me. I will uh, go through it again. OK, so the other thing is you can go in the other direction. So suppose um, you're trying to make a stock or something, and, and you want to you know, combine this mutation with that other mutation because you want to make individuals that have both of them, and you want to see what, it, you know, uh, what the phenotype is or, or whatever, um, or you just want to check something. Um, so uh, oops, what you would do, uh, if you if you already know the distance apart, that can tell you how many crossover progeny you would expect. And the way you do it is you take the R value. Suppose the R value is 0.2 or something. Um, and then you have 1 minus R. So this is the chance of crossover occurring. And this is chance of crossover not occurring. 
uh, in your progeny. And so you would do your cross. Here's your parental cross. Um, and here's um, your F1. And then the probability of the gametes produced by this um, parent is um, for the two dominants together, since the original parent had two dominants, um, it's going to be 1 minus R, 0.8, right? Um, and half of them are going to look like this, and the other half are going to look like that. So each of these is going to be seen 0.4. Um, or 40% of the progeny. And then um, the recombinant ones, uh, if a crossover occurs, then uh, half of the progeny, that result is, is going to be this type, and half is going to be that type. So it's going to be 1 half times r, or 0 0.1. Okay. And so if you look at these and go, OK, I'm going to expect 40% progeny that look like this, and 40% progeny that look like this, and 10% progeny that look like this, and 10% progeny that look like this. If you want to make sure you've calculated it correctly, these are the only four types of progeny that you could get. It should add up to 1 or 100%. 1 if you're doing decimals, and 100% if you're doing it in percentages. Okay, So a good problem solver checks their work, so you, you use some sort of logic to, to check and back and make sure that what you've calculated makes sense. Okay, but this allows you to predict. So if I make this cross and I and I really want you know the recombinant ones, then um, I'm going to have to do like well over a hundred because only ten uh, of each of these types are expected. And if I do a hundred just from random variation, I might not get very many of the, the genotype I want. Maybe if I'm planning an experiment, maybe I'll plan to collect 500 progeny so I can be sure that I get lots of these recombinant ones for, you know, whatever my experiment was that I wanted to do. Okay, uh, so this is just a clicker question. Um, think it through, stop the tape, make a uh, suggestion <laughs> um, just as a self-test. Okay, so you've done this cross. The dot just means we don't know if the genes are linked or if they're unlinked. Um, and then when we look at the progeny, we look at these uh, phenotypes and we look at these phenotypes and we see um, that they are equal. Uh, so when you add these, they're all equal. Oops, there we are. So there's our answer. The genes are not linked because um, because the, the recombinant and non-recombinant phenotypes are approximately the same. We're seeing equal amounts of each possible phenotype, so therefore the genes are not on the same chromosome. Okay, and then just um, because you one of the challenge assignments that's coming up for you uh, is a Punnett square exercise, um, I will just point out that um, when you're predicting, so here's a cross, um, and you're predicting um, what the uh, uh, offspring should look like, uh, assuming the genes are unlinked. You know what would you expect? You've done Punnett squares before. Um, I don't know why this keeps floating to the next slide. It must be maybe it's a, something I'm doing with the mouse. Um, anyhow, um, there will be a chance for you to to do this, looking at linked genes and unlinked genes and looking at uh, a case where you're working with flies where males don't have any crossover, which won't make sense to you yet, but will um, after we have um, the uh, next week's uh, lectures. And so um, this just um, gives you, this shows you, where is my mouse here? Uh, this just shows you um, the different categories of gametes that you should be uh, putting into your Punnett square. And then it also shows you um, how to figure out what the frequency is. They may not be equally likely. If the genes are closely linked, you're going to have two smaller uh, categories and two larger. So for example, in the case of the map distances I gave in the previous one, you'd have um, for your non-recombinant ones 0.4 and 0.4, although th these may not be the same allele combinations, I can't remember, uh, and 0.1. And then you would figure out the genotypes, but then you'd also multiply the probabilities. 
Uh, so that is just a hint and that may not feel satisfying yet, but when, once I've opened that challenge assignment for enrichment, um, this will make more sense and you can refer back to this to help you answer uh, the question. Um, so to do recombination mapping, you want to always use test crosses. Uh, you should know why. Um, if you if you try to do this with a dihybrid cross where both parents were uh, heterozygous and both parents had crossover, that's what the Punnett square exercise will show you. Um, you really would have to work hard to uh, look at the offspring that, that result and work backwards to figure out what the uh, crossover frequency was. Um, so uh, when you look at the results, determine which are the parental and non-parental, there will be more of these and fewer of these. That's the, that's the clue, right? That's how you can figure it out. Calculate your R value and then multiply your R value by 100% to convert into map units. Okay, now uh, here's an example. Um, of actually just figuring out recombination distance um, or well this could be Punnett square too. Um, so if you know what R is you can do a test cross and you can calculate um, those frequencies like I showed on a previous slide but also if you did the experiment I'm just going to skip that because I've said it already uh, if you were if you did that actual experiment uh, even if you didn't know if the genes were linked or not, you did the, the experiment with the dihybrid and cross it to uh, a homozygous recessive individual, and you saw the progeny. You could first of all tell um, what the original parents were because you can see what the two higher categories are. So those original parents were had the one had the both dominants and one had both recessives, right? And that means that this cross was actually big A, big B over little a, little b, um, cross to homozygous recessive, right? And then we can easily calculate the map distance because here are our crossover progeny. And so 9 plus 11, that's 20 crossover progeny. Uh, 38 plus 42 is going to be 80. So that's divided by the total, which is 100. And so therefore, R is 0.2. So the genes are 20 map units apart. So you would just um, draw your chromosome, and then you draw the A gene and the B gene. And the way we show map units um, you can do it in a number of ways, but I actually just like the double-headed arrow. Uh, the two lines indicate the positions of the genes, and then you just put 20 map units. Um, and that's how you do that. Okay, I think that's all the background you need. Oops, <laughs> I forgot that I had this here. Okay, so um, that will be shown up in your, your own notes. Okay, um, and as I said, we now know that the, the female up here, uh, we know that because of uh, the frequencies of these. So I want you to be familiar enough with this to be given, be given the R value and be able to predict what you should get, and but also to be able to look at the results and figure out what the R value is. So we want you to be working both forwards and backwards uh, for this one. And it, it just, it takes practice. And so um, the, uh, the challenge assignment two provides practice at that. And if you're stuck, uh, just ask us and we can provide some guidance. Okay, that's it. Thank you and hope that was helpful.